Good afternoon. My name is Jim Hoagland. I want to welcome you and to thank those of you who returned from lunch so promptly. Uh, and we'll move right along in getting this, uh, I think, very promising discussion about the Middle East underway. We have two distinguished diplomats and men of education uh, who will discuss the various problems with short opening statements. Then we'll have some discussion between them and move to the audience for Q&A. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Manuel Hassassin, the Palestinian ambassador to the United Kingdom, and Itamar Rubinovich, uh, who was longtime ambassador in Washington, um, to uh, address us today. Uh, ambassador Rubinovich was uh, one of the most respected diplomats who's ever served in Washington in recent years. Um, he's also a man who is associated quite uh, actively with Tel Aviv University, New York University, and other institutions of education. Ambassador Hassassin was um, also uh, came out of the field of higher education, was a minister of higher education, uh, and has been for the last 10 years the Palestinian ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you to address uh, what I think is a central question uh, that is formed to some extent on an impression, but I'd like you to uh, take it into consideration as you make your opening statements and perhaps either focus your remarks or add on to your remarks to, uh, to deal with it. Um, a little over a year ago, I was at a conference somewhat like this in uh, Abu Dhabi that brought together uh, leading officials, intellectuals, uh, from the Arab world to discuss the most pressing problems of the day. And for two and a half days, this conference did not devote a single word to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And I've had that same experience in subsequent discussions. It's almost as if the issue has disappeared, as particularly in the Arab world, it is seen more urgent today to talk about the Sunni Shiite problems, to talk about Yemen, to talk about certainly Syria, and to put into eclipse the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that, I want to use it as the basis for a question that I think stands on its own. And it's based on my feeling that neither the Israeli government nor the Palestinian Authority today act in any meaningful way, as if it's possible to have a two-state solution. What are the consequences of such a situation? Ambassador Brevinich. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim, for this uh, kind introduction and opening statement. And for me, the, the consequence of no movement on the Israeli-Palestinian issue is uh, the transition from a two-state solution to one-state solution, which for me is a nightmare. And my concern for a two-state solution comes primarily from concern with the future of my own country. I think it's vital for us uh, to separate from the Palestinians, to have a two-state solution, namely a Palestinian state as the nation state of the Palestinian people and uh, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, coexisting peacefully uh, with, uh, with one another. Now, at, at present, we seem to be deadlocked. Um, and the question is, how do we come out of the deadlock and move again into an open highway? And right now, right now, if you, let's say, open tomorrow a conference, a peace conference trying to reach a two-state solution, I'm afraid it will fail. Uh, we have a, a right-wing government in Israel. We have, uh, unfortunately, a weak leadership in the Palestinian Authority, of, uh, led by a, a gentleman I respect, but who is towards the end of his career. Uh, we have, of course, Hamas in, in Gaza that uh, is, uh, does not accept the authority of the Palestinian Authority. And we have a U.S. administration that is not considered, I would say, by almost everyone in the Middle East as the potential uh, coordinator uh, <coughs> of a peace process with the same degree of success that previous administrations did in the 
90s and in the, the first decade of uh, the first few years of this uh, of this century. So the and, and of course, whatever else happens in the Middle East, uh, as you described, uh, concerns in Abu Dhabi is, is not helpful uh, for that. Now, you could say, logically speaking, if you cannot reach a final status agreement, let's go for some kind of an interim agreement in order to stop the current mayhem and, and bloodshed. This is not acceptable to the Palestinian side because they would say you, an interim solution will just perpetuate the, uh, the, the status quo and will serve to, uh, to preserve Israeli control. It's not acceptable. If it's not acceptable, what can we do? My proposal is this. Uh, in the late spring, early summer of, 19, uh, of 2014, Secretary Kerry, before admitting failure of his latest effort to arrange for a deal between Israel and, and the Palestinian, presented uh, Abu Mazen, uh, President Abbas, uh, with a paper, which he included concessions that he obtained from Netanyahu and said, let's work with this. It was rejected by uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. My proposal is this, take this, take, take this paper in which Netanyahu made significant concessions. He does not advertise them because he's afraid of his own party <coughs> and, and coalition, but they were significant. And accept it as a, as a framework. Say, okay, this, this could be the, the end game. And in the meantime, let's talk about an interim solution with the end game in sight. This should resolve the issue of Palestinian concern with, a, with an interim solution being becoming a sort of a permanent solution and it will enable us to open a negotiation on the many possibilities that we have for dealing with the immediate problems. Uh, let me just mention Area C uh, in the West Bank. 60% of the West Bank is controlled by Israel. There's a lot that can be done there. Um, a lot of other measures can be taken that would improve life and would start rebuilding the confidence that has now been lost between Israelis and Palestinians. So to sum up, uh, present the, uh, the Kerry framework as a vision for a final status, start a negotiation on a series of, of measures, rebuild the confidence and the trust that have been lost, and get us out of the present mayhem into hopefully what could become uh, a major highway uh, to a better state of things. Mr. Ambassador, the Kerry paper as a path to uh, interim uh, negotiations? Let me make some general remarks Please. before we proceed. I think if we don't put uh, the conflict in the right context, then this discussion will end up to be like a discussion between two partners to conflict that have overwhelmingly overcome the hurdles and the challenges of the trust which is a most important factor in any kind of negotiations. We have to understand that this conflict has been a protracted conflict with two epistemic communities that transcended the boundaries of fighting over a piece of territory. Today, the struggle between Palestinians and Israelis is a struggle of existence. It's a, it's, it is a struggle to maintain our national identity, our geography, our demography in this conflict. And it is important to bear in mind that we cannot continue the dialogue as we did for the last 22 years because it was a dismal failure. Why? For the simple fact that there was no acceptance that the Palestinian side is accepted on parity level, on mutual level, where we have been you know, in a situation where the top dog is constantly dictating the terms of reference to the underdog and unfortunately, Jim, I have to say that the third party that was supposed to be an honest broker for peace unequivocally was supporting the top dog over the underdog. That in itself created a disequilibrium in the entire process of dialogue and negotiations. Now, Mr. Rabinovich and myself, we know for a fact that the six permanent issues I have led 52 second track negotiations, and I have met with Israelis at all levels, ex-politicians, top military brass, uh, professors and what have you, and we have our friend Meir Shitri, who is sitting in front, with whom I had at least six or seven 
kind of negotiations where we have agreed on the parameters of how to solve this conflict. But I think the problem is in the state of mind of the Israelis. There is a crisis of leadership in Israel. We don't see that bold move coming forward in the context of concession, which I hate as a concept, because Israel is not conceding. Israel is giving the right to self-determination for Palestinians who have been under occupation for so many years now. If you ask me today, I totally agree with Mr. Rabinovich. We are stuck today, Palestinians and Israelis, between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. We have tried time and again with the Annapolis. We continued, continued all the time with a president like Mahmoud Abbas, whom I think should be the author in the Webster Dictionary, the author of pragmatism. He has been choosing between constraints all along. And for that reason, I don't think that Mr. Abbas is a weak president. It's the disempowerment of President Abbas by the Israeli negotiations, by the Israeli leadership, have led to the rise of Hamas and to all kinds of extremism because the desperation in the peace process have led to the rise and movement of such militants, you know, among Palestinians who think that the only way towards this solution is by using convulsive violence. I say there will never be a military solution to this conflict. Israel has won five major wars in the Middle East, but it failed dismally in bringing security to its own individuals. Now, the Kerry paper and other papers that have been submitted, it's time and again. We, are, we have to change our attitude. We have to change our strategy for negotiations. Unless the Israelis look eye to eye to the Palestinians at the negotiating table, nothing is going to move forward. And as long as we have such a fascist regime today in Israel, controlled by the settlers, by the extreme religious wing, I don't think we have any chance for moving forward in the peace process. Now, if I believe that we have people like Meir, like Rabinovich, you know, who have a long-standing experience in understanding the psyche and the mentality of the Palestinians in the negotiations process, appreciating our history, appreciating our struggle, I think then I can tell you I'm hopeful. But with the current, with the current regime in Israel, I think it's hopeless. I believe that Netanyahu is the most moderate and pragmatic in this government. And if he is the most pragmatic in this government, how on earth if I can sit and debate with one of his cabinet ministers rather than debating with Rabinovich, with whom I can agree at least 80% on his way of how to solve this problem. Now, we Palestinians, we have to maintain our stand, our resilience, that the problem does not lie with how to move forward with the negotiations. One important factor, or two important factors that mold basically this conflict has always been the mutual distrust and the mutual fear. And if we don't transcend that psychological burden of fear and distrust, let alone the added dimension of religion in this conflict, which scares me to death, that we are back into the zero-sum conflict, their gains are my losses. I believe that the Palestinians today are ready to go back to the negotiating table. We have not opted for violence because violence is a recipe for disaster. Now, we have no other choice except to go to the international organizations. We believe, we believe that the honest broker of peace cannot be continued by the United States that proved its failure for the last 22 years, because its approach was always focused on crisis management let me, rather than conflict resolution. Let me be sure I understand you. Are you calling on the United States to withdraw from its mediating role? I'm calling on the United States to be more proactive and to be unequivocal in its support. And I think it should give some room to the European Union to stop being pairs for this conflict, but to become proactive players in the political process. This is what I want to see. I don't want to see the United States hijacking this political process in the Middle East, where we have witnessed 22 years of deterioration and exacerbation of violence. This is what I would like to see. You know, I, it, it's interesting because I don't think many of, or any of the critics I can think of of President Obama have accused him of harboring some secret desire to hijack the negotiations. In fact, 
the, the term of art around the White House is uh, strategic retrenchment from obligations overseas. So I'm, I'm not quite sure, but to put it as a question to you, why not accept the Kerry paper as a starting point? The Kerry paper shorts falls too short in the aspirations of the Palestinians. As I said earlier, one of the basic problems of this conflict and the deterioration of this conflict is the fact that Israel, to a certain degree approved by the United States, have continued incrementally to disempower the moderate forces within the PLO, i.e. President Abbas. And this is what's happening today in the Arab world. <clears throat> we have to bear in mind that the failure of the peace process, the non-solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is the fulcrum of peace and stability in the region, had been totally derailed by looking at the transient phenomenon that are the culmination of the failure of the peace process to basically see the advent of extremism like Daesh, Jabhat al-Nusra and what have you. These, they did not emanate from the fact that they have seen corruption within the moderate secular regimes in the Middle East as much as they have seen the failure of a peace process, the failure of solu sol uh, solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is the essence and the fulcrum, I would say, of stability in the region. And for that particular fact, why are we dealing with the results rather than going to the root cause of the problem? And I'm so happy from Mr. Thierry de Montbrial to make it a point after yesterday having a long three hours discussion on the Middle East, talking about the culmination of the failure of the peace process, and to have to give us the chance today for 45 minutes to talk about, you know, why the Middle East is so and how we have to move forward in finding plausible solutions to this conflict. That's exactly what we're trying to do in this conversation, which I don't want to degenerate into a back and forth over whose leadership crisis is most severe. No, I will tell you what we have to because do. Because it can be said of the Palestinian leadership, it is also in a state of crisis with a president whose mandate is long expired, but I don't think we ought to get into that kind of exchange. But I do want to give Ambassador Ravinovich a chance to comment particularly on the, the yeah. U.S. role. First, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Mr. Hassassian referred to my government as a fascist government. I'm not a supporter of this government, but it's not a fascist government. So let's eliminate name calling from, uh, from this discussion. Second, the point about Hamas. The rise of Hamas is not a result of the failure of the peace process, but Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And we know that uh, fundamentalist Islam is surging in the whole region. And this is the particular manifestation in the, in the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian community. So it's not a welcome development, but it's, it's part of, of the regional, regional trend. And uh, we have to, to accept it as, as such. That is to say, we have to bear in mind that even if Israel and uh, Mahmoud Abbas reach an agreement, there will be a problem of implementation in Gaza, and there may be a problem of trying to sabotage or derail the agreement by firing rockets from Gaza. That, that is a threat that we have to take, take into account. Thirdly, uh, let, us be, let us be concrete and specific. We don't have too much time. I'd like to hear what is wrong with the Kerry proposals. That, uh, uh, if we want to move forward, uh, let's, let's hear what's missing or what's uh, too abundant in, in the Kerry proposals. Fourth, the U.S. role. Uh, the U.S. role is, is diminished. The EU is a welcome supporter. Uh, but, you know, leadership is not uh, given, it's taken. If the European Union manages to position itself uh, in the position that the United States has had for many years as the only party that is acceptable to both, that can help mediate an agreement and can underwrite it. And the fact is that the two peace agreements that we have with Egypt and with Jordan have been finalized with the help of the United States. And I've seen no substitute to that position to date. Well, I think one of the things that's missing, or one of the problems with the Kerry paper, if I understand your position correctly, is simply that there's a loss of faith in the United States. You don't accept the good faith of the United States as a negotiator, in which case there's no point in our continuing in that role. 
that's, uh, that's not the issue. The carry paper still revolves around the same approach, the same methodology of incrementalism. Right. Incrementalism has been a disaster. A disaster we have witnessed it in the Oslo Agreement. The Oslo Agreement has brought us basically to what we are today. If we have put the Palestinians and the Israeli negotiating teams on both sides in a big room, like in the Vatican, let them struggle inside until the white smoke comes. It cannot be done on incrementalism. We have witnessed that two, two decades with the, with the, of course, with the shepherd of the United States, you know, going into the details of this have led to extremism on both sides. And I, when I say, when you infuse religion into this conflict, it becomes much more dangerous and much more complicated to solve. That's why, you know, our approach to the Kerry is a Kaduk approach. It has to change dramatically. I believe that if Mr. Netanyahu is willing to stop settlements, and when I refer, sir, to a fascist government, you know, what is being practiced, and I'm not talking about occupation, how ugly and repulsive it is, in using all means of extrajudicial killings and demolitions and what have you, there is nothing with the bypass roads and with the ethnic cleansing process that we are witnessing in Palestine, I couldn't find to say Israel is a democratic country because this is a gimmick and cannot really be accepted. If Israel is a democratic entity, it is only a democratic entity for the Jews that live in Israel. And we don't want to generate a discussion on that. I'm just trying to say that such a government, if you don't like the word fascism, but I will say that it is an extreme colonial type of a government that believes in a one-state solution, i.e. controlling the occupied territories. And I too agree with you, the two-state solution is the only solution for our problem. But what is happening today is we are witnessing a two-state delusion. And that delusion will prompt me to put all my maximum efforts in having a one-man, one-vote kind of a one-state solution. And Hamas, sir, is not a terrorist organization. I refuse that. Hamas is an integral part of the Palestinian people. Now, they are frustrated. They don't recognize the state of Israel, I do agree. But Fatah never recognized the state of Israel per se. Israel has been dealing with the PLO. And the PLO since Arafat until his death, we have seen nothing moving in this peace process. And that's why the failure of that peace process made Hamas and other organizations to come forward as the alternative leadership to the PLO. And this is where we feel that we have been disempowered in this, negotiations per, uh, uh, in this negotiation process to reach you know, the stalemate that we have reached today. Yeah. I, I want to move on to another subject, let, let but, me, but briefly. Yeah, but just, just briefly. I, I will not fall into the trap of, of trying to refute uh, the allegations or to, to start name calling with regard to Palestinian actions, because that's not the purpose of, of this meeting. But one comment about Hamas. You said Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Let me remind you what Hamas did to your own people when they captured Gaza. They threw your people off the roofs in Gaza. It is a terrorist organization, not just with regard to us, but also with regard to you. Let me try to come at this from a, a slightly broader angle. Um, Ambassador Bravinovich, you are probably Israel's most noted student of Syria, and you participated in the negotiations with the Syrians. The world is arguing today very much about what to do in Syria. Uh, we have some views, the Russians have some views. The voices that I do not hear talking about Syria are the Israeli government and the Palestinian government. Why not? Is it a case of better the devil you know than the jihadi you don't know, or something else? No. <clears throat> uh, there is a debate in, in, in Israel, and it's quite public, about uh, what is better for Israel. The devil you know or the devil you don't know. The devil you know is Assad and company, and the devil you don't know are the Islamists or, or the jihadis. Personally, I, I, I'm more concerned with the, with the axis, Tehran, Damascus, Hezbollah, then I am with the, with the opposition. But I think you don't hear too, too many voices from Israel with regard to Syria, because uh, our, our inter interference, uh, physically or verbally, would be counterproductive. 
It's been the policy and the argument of the Assad regime from day one that this is not a genuine domestic revolt, that this is a conspiracy hatched from the outside. And if we add our voice to the choir, we would be playing into the regime's propaganda. So while I'm critical of certain policies of, of my government, I think the policy conducted with regard to Syria during the four and a half years has kept us out of the conflict and has been on the whole a wise and successful policy. Ambassador, you have? Yes. And, uh, and could you add your own interpretation of the Israeli attitude towards Syria, as well as the Palestinian attitude? Well, uh, actually, you know, the Palestinians have learned long lessons when they are, and when they were, all the time being forced to be part of inter-Arab politics. And the prices that we have paid as a result of inter-Arab politics have been detrimental to our national ethos and to our existence. And that's why today, you know, we the Palestinians and the leadership have taken a certain kind of a firm stand on the issues of not interfering in the internal politics. But definitely we are with the aspirations of the Syrian people, what they want to see, what kind of a government they want to see. And definitely we are among those who push for democratization, for building civil societies, for inculcating, you know, a, a peace culture. This is what we witnessed, you know, in our practices during the first Oslo uh, period. We thought that, you know, peacemaking is not enough to withstand and to sustain the, pro, uh, the longevity of peace unless people to people have to make that kind of peace and emanating from the negotiating partners themselves, because we have to live eventually with the decisions of our negotiations. I believe that neither the United States nor the international community could impose solutions. Those solutions are recipe for disaster. It has to come from our deep conviction how to sustain peace and how to move forward. And I do empathize to a certain degree with the Israeli position, because Israel has a full plate to deal with. And being involved, you know, in one way or another, with what is happening in the Middle East, I cannot exonerate Israel from being a rooted cause in this. Because Israel is an occupying power. It has been, you know, a destabilizing factor in the Middle East that, that leads basically to such an instability. Because if you talk to any scholars, historians, leaders, today they tell you the crux of the problem in the Middle East is the mother problem i.e. the Palestinian problem. And if I think the security of the state of Israel will also be maintained and sustained for a long period of time if we have that, that conflict being resolved. And the only way to resolve it is to come forward to the negotiating table. And that's why I like the title of Palestinian-Israeli dialogue. I'm not here to debate him, because if I want to debate him, we will never finish. This is the blaming fingers cannot stop. I came here with the attitude of finding solution from a wise diplomat from Israel who could tell me, who could tell me exactly what is the recipe for a successful negotiation that I could relate to my president. And if we have short, shortcomings in this process, I think you know we are open to learn because in the final analysis, both of us want peace. 70% of our societies want peace, and we should not really undermine that. And we should be at the forefront rather than be victims to radical groups on both sides who hijacked this peace process and brought it to a stalemate. But I think the ambassador has given you already a proposal that you don't like. Yeah. So we're stuck no, there. I, let me, let no, me I didn't say on. I don't like, excuse me. You didn't accept. Uh, uh, no, I didn't say that I don't like. I did not even comment on his proposal. I would like to see major amendments because this kind of a proposal, you're just scratching the top. We have to go deep, deep into the six issues. We have to put them on the table. Let's not say, let's start with this because this is easy. Let's start with the, this is easy. No, you put all the issues because they are organically intertwined like Catholic marriage, no divorce between them. Either we have a package deal, end of conflict, end of claims and we move forward or else it will be a recipe for disaster. We've seen it. We've seen it time and again and we are repeating the same mistakes. But, but there's something a little out of sync here, I think, and I go back to my opening, which is that in fact, I, and I very much respect the answer you gave about the involvement in inter-Arab politics. I think it was a lesson well learned. 
But today, this is the Arab, the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli issue is not seen as the overriding question. The overriding question is the existential struggle between basically Saudi Arabia, Sunni, and Iran, Shiite. How does the how does that really fit into, and we'll wind this part of the program up and move to the audience. How does that really fit into the approach, Israel, Palestine, of getting, getting moving yeah. forward? Yeah, I'd like to make three brief, brief comments. One is, uh, I, I completely disagree with the statement that this is, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the root cause of, of the problem in the Middle East. When uh, Islamic State people are uh, massacring Yazidis in Iraq, it has nothing to do with Israelis and, and Palestinians and so forth and, and so forth. Second, you know, it is now fashionable to badmouth the Oslo Accord. It had many problems and it ultimately not, uh, was not successful, but there are two, two accomplishments that it has. One is the mutual recognition. We recognize the PLO as the legitimate spokesman for Palestinian nationalism, and they recognize the state of, of Israel. And that is still there. Second is, we are, not, we are not administering the lives of Palestinians in the West Bank or in Gaza. These are not administering. No, no, it's... Yeah, uh, I understand. It's, and thirdly, I would like to add an element to what I've discussed. Uh, the element is that of secret negotiations. Part of the problem with the Kerry effort and other efforts in, in the last two decades is that they have been public. I myself, when I negotiated with the Syrians, had both public and private negotiations. The public negotiation is a problem because you are monitored all the time by the media, by the public opinion, you are criticized, the pressures build up. You may or may not like the Oslo Accord, but it was reached only because it was conducted secretly away from everybody's attention in, in uh, rustic uh, Oslo. So uh, I think an element of going back to the negotiating table should be an, a, a period of quiet, discreet negotiations. Without it, it's difficult to envisage a success. Thank you for your brevity. You've set the right mark. I hope you can match it. Uh, well, you know, I don't want to delve into the Arab politics as much because, you know, my focus is on how we can get and move forward with this peace process. Uh, today, there is no peace, there is no process, there is no tunnel. You know, all this semantics that we used to have, Meir, and he's smiling, we don't have it anymore. But I totally agree with you, Mr. Ambassador, that the question of being public in negotiations is something that was detrimental. And that's why the Washington talks have failed. And that's why the back channel, with all its shortcomings in Oslo, have proved to be much more successful in at least you know, kicking off you know, something that is called real negotiations between the two parts. But the question of the objective conditions, that you know, the external threats, the internal contrad contradictions within a democratic society like Israel, when it, when it has elections, so the, the politics per se has changed leadership change perceptions and cognitions all along the line. And on, on, on our side also as Palestinians, we have shifted from the vacillation between being statesmen like Arafat at one time and revolutionary at another, gave the wrong messages to the Israelis whether, whether it should be taken seriously or not. And the end result, you know, you saw with 2004, Arafat is gone. We have a new era and that new era was totally based on the non-military solution, on a pragmatic approach, open dialogue, accepting negotiations through political accommodation, you know, to come to an agreement in ending this conflict. We have seen that, but we did not see a kind of a response from the other side to move forward by empowering, you know, the underdog in this peace process to come forward even more, while the concessions have always been by the underdog all along with the pressures being put by a third party, sorry to say it, Jim, like the United States of America. I will stick to my guns when it comes to the US. I appreciate your clarity. And I think it's time to give the audience a shot at both of you. Uh, I've, I've noticed in our sessions that uh, the physical setup of the room actually uh, dictates that the moderators call on the front rows almost all of the time. I wanna throw out a challenge to those in the back 
Uh, let's see some hands so we can at least get some geographical diversity. And any lady who has a question will be particularly favored by the moderator. Uh, so if I don't see any hands from the rear, I'm going to go to the front. Uh, please state your name and any affiliation. Uh, Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates. Uh, first a comment and then a question. The comment is that I think very few people in Washington today would agree with the notion that this administration would be too much in favor of Israel in brokering any discussions between Israel and Palestine. In fact, I think quite the contrary. My question is this. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in Washington last week, met with President Obama. Just yesterday, Jonathan Pollard was released. This has been a, a very difficult issue in Israeli-US relations for years. Uh, suddenly, he's released. Ambassador Rabinovich, uh, Rabinovich what was the deal here? Uh, there was no deal. He, he served his 30 years. Uh, you know, it was a, it was an awkward, uh, it was an awkward moment or 30 years in, in our relationship. It, uh, I myself as ambassador had to deal with it several, several times, but it's a peripheral issue. It's not a core issue in the relationship between the United States and, uh, and Israel. It became, unfortunately, a little bit of a right-wing issue in, in my country, but uh, fortunately, it's, it's over. But as they say in, in the movie Casablanca, it's, uh, it's just a coincidence. He served his 30 years, and it was time to go home. Okay, uh, I'll go to the distinguished-looking gentleman here. Microphone. Uh, Ambassador Morotinus. Okay. I wasn't getting our peace process. Thank you. Well, you know, my friends, you know, I, I feel myself so much engaged, so much uh, committed, and I reassure the audience, uh, Itamar and Manuel are excellent ambassadors, and, and we allow them to make peace, they will succeed. Hmm? Uh, so, um, even with these divergences in your uh, statement, I feel there is a lack of, uh, I mean, there is a wish of uh, making a final effort for making peace. Uh, Itamar, you say at the beginning, in the introduction remark, you are afraid to go for one state solution. For you will be a catastrophe. I fully agree with you. So let's go for the two state solution. Manuel said that the situation today is because uh, Oslo Agreement, this incremental approach, this uh, gradualism, has also made uh, the process to fail. In Oslo, everything was well de defined, the final statute issue, but there was one missing target, the end of the, the tunnel, what will be the final goal. You say, Itamar, rightly, that uh, in this uh, fantastic ceremony in September 1993, President Clinton took the hand of uh, President Arafat and Prime Minister Rabin, and they say, well, okay, we recognize the PLO, and the Palestinians recognize the state of Israel. But there was an asymmetry in this recognition. Israel recognized the PLO, but even there to put in the final status issue at the end game, the Palestinian state. So you don't think the time has come for good sake, I mean, why this attitude in Israel and the United States to have this uh, absolutely obsession of not recognizing the Palestinian state? If you want a two-state solution, then you negotiate in equal terms what are going to be the territory, the boundaries, the security, the settlement, Jerusalem. Why there is this a kind of paralysis that make the administration, the US administration and the Israelis, not to make the, this step forward of this asymmetry 
that was made in 1993 to say the time has come for a double recognition. Israel will be recognized by the whole Arab League and the, and the Islamic State, and Palestine will be recognized by Israel, United States, and the whole European Union. And then you start to negotiate. So the time has come for this extra effort to get out of the box. It's not carry or not carry. Yeah. It's Mark, can you give the, us way, yeah. the way to get out with new formulas in order to get the process okay. forward. Thank you very the, much. The answer is very short. There are three words, uh, four words. Finality and no more claims. Once the Palestinian leadership announces that any agreement is going to be final and the end of claims, there will be sweeping support in Israel for recognizing Palestinian statehood. I mean, the principle of statehood has been recognized even by a right-wing Prime Minister Netanyahu, definitely recognized by uh, the Obama administration. Uh, so these four magic words of no more claims and finality are the key uh, to resolving that particular question. Brief. Very brief. I believe why today the Palestinian leadership has been adamantly with strenuous resilience going to the international organizations and to the United Nations in getting the recognition of a state. I can't believe that the international community has shouldered the responsibility of a two-state solution. And when you talk about a two-state solution, why don't you recognize the Palestinian side on the borders of 1967 and leave the negotiations for the contours of that state between the Palestinians and the Israelis? But to, to start with the, with the notion that Israel is there as a democracy exists, and the Palestinians are still struggling for the basic human rights to self-determination and put them not in the context of a state-to-state -state relationship in any negotiations, it's a, it's a failure. It's going to be a total failure. And for that reason, we went to the United Nations to establish that the 1967 lines are the state of Palestine. And these are not disputed territories. These are territories under occupation, and, and because they are under occupation, we have to end the claim, we have to clinch this conflict, and we have to recognize each other, not by de facto, but by de jure, and have that vision of coordination and coexistence for the future. That's the approach that we should have if we are really having the, the, the actual state of mind of solving this conflict. But I think the problem today is with the mindsets in, in leaderships. Well, your colleague has just proposed a step that he says will change the Israeli mindset. Finality. Finality is, is accepted totally by us. You've got the statement. We, we've earned. Mayor Sharif. Thank you. I would like to uh, make a comment. One of the biggest mistakes done in Oslo is the fact that Oslo had been done by stages. In my opinion, this is the main obstacle on the way to peace. If we would do the peace in Oslo from advance, concluding everything, and then implying them during five years or 10 years, every side will try to keep any point of the agreement. That's exactly what happened with Egypt. With Egypt, we make an agreement of peace, and then during five years was the implementation of withdrawal from Sinai, and every side was doing everything to keep every point of the agreement. In Oslo, the thing was the thought that by going by stages, we first solve the simple problems, and during the years, maybe we'll be so friendly that we can solve the problems of border in Jerusalem, etc. It was the worst mistake, because during the process of going by stages, each side trying to score points on the way, and therefore they're fighting like a hell on every small point, instead of doing it vice versa. So the problem is, and I agree with Mr. Hassassian, today there is no way for more stages. Either we have a final agreement of peace, and really final demands as well, final claims, or nothing. There is no other way. Secondly, it's impossible to make peace by a broken phone. That's the reason why Kerry could not make peace. It was a failure, because he was speaking to Israelis on one side, and then to Palestinians on the other side, during all the negotiation, there were, even, there were not even one meeting between Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. How can you make peace with somebody without meeting him? 
I believe that the United States should withdraw from peace. Ah. And I believe that Israel and Palestinians should see themselves. It is an Israeli Palestinian problem. We should negotiate it ourselves. And I would prefer to do it with the Arab League. Because the Arab initiative creates something which we've never been before. It's suggested to make a general peace with all the Islam countries, 57 countries, if we solve the problem with the Palestinians. I think that the Arab League can be very, very helpful to bring us together to an agreement because there is parts, even if Prime Minister of Israel would say what Hassan said, what Abu Mazen said, 67 borders, not literally, but the same territory. And the, all the, the neighborhoods in Jerusalem will be go back to Palestine for your uh, capital. Still, Palestinians will not sign. That's the reason why Abu Mazen didn't sign with Olmert and Arafat didn't sign with Barak, even he suggested almost everything. Because the Palestinians, leader cannot take by himself the decision which they know, every leader of Arab know that we cannot accept returning back of refugees into the state of Israel. That can be done only by the Arab League. So the way to circumvent the situation, in my opinion, is direct negotiation between Israel, Palestinian, with the support of the Arab League. Thank you very much. We've had some uh, exciting proposals here. Uh, we've run out of time also. I just want to give uh, the floor for very, very brief uh, comments, and we'll start with Ambassador Hassiasen. You know, uh, if I had paid Mayur Chetri to say what he has <laughs> said, you know... We thought you. Mayur. Yeah, he just made my conclusion. Thank you. Two, two points. One is, uh, uh, if I heard uh, Mr. Hassiasen say the word, we accept finality, it's been worth my trip to... Uh, uh, to Switzerland. Second, we cannot conclude such a discussion without the Henry Kissinger story. So, Mr. Hassassian, Professor Hassassian, Ambassador Hassassian, Kissinger was once asked, how do I call you? Dr. Kissinger, Professor Kissinger, Mr. Kissinger? And he said, your majesty will do. <laughs> <laughs> and on that <laughs> remark, we will close this very, very, I think in the end, very constructive conversation and uh, I appreciate all the audience at interest and I apologize for not having more chance to get questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done.